So welcome to this week's walk around Untermeyer Gardens. Today we're going to focus on the Rock and Stream Garden. Um, Untermeyer had planted this as a rather sophisticated, intricate garden in his day. It took us over a year to be able to uncover enough vegetation to actually be able to find it. Then over the past several years, we've been restoring the stream and planting the structural woodies. And finally this spring, we we're able to start putting some perennials in. So let's go take a look at what we've been doing. So here we are at the top of the Rock and Stream Garden where the water originates. Um, I kind of call this the blue pool informally, partly because we've used blue foliage and blue flowers throughout this area. And when I say blue flowers in horticulture, of course, I mean purple. But I'm standing in between a triplet of Picea omarica bruns, which is a fairly whimsical plant, very tight and columnar, somewhat weeping habit, but in a really irregular trunk shape. Um, there's a lot of character in these plants. They almost seem to have a personality. Every once in a while when I'm over here by myself, I actually think somebody snuck up on me when they're in the corner of my eye. Um, moving through the garden a little bit, um, we come up to another interesting conifer in the blues. This is Pinus parviflora bergman. Um, it's a semi-dwarf, so it shouldn't get much more than three to five feet. Again, we planted multiples in here. Very interesting, tight foliage. Um, the early spring growth gets a really interesting red tint to it as well. And now you can see these cones that will persist through the rest of the season. Stepping back, there's an iris that's just past its peak for us a little bit, but I really want to bring it up. It's an iris hybrid called Iris Robusta. Um, this one is called Graham Darby. It's a purple flowering plant, but of interest, the early spring foliage emerges very purple, and you can just see some of that color remaining at the moment. So here we are next to this iris insada. It's a cultivar called Temple Bells. We're growing this for its deep, dark flowers. Um, the falls really don't have much color in it, just a little hint of yellow. And it really pops against this background of another Pinus parviflora, this one called Gimborn's Ideal. Very similar to the Bergman we looked at earlier, but a bit more narrow and upright habit. Otherwise, very similar in characteristic. So in addition to the blue foliage for conifers we try to use for the garden, um, we've also snuck in some yellow. This is a meta sequoia, Glyptostroboides ogon, sometimes known in the trade as gold rush. It's one of the fastest growing trees on the market. It's one of my favorite trees for this yellow foliage. Um, it's one of five deciduous conifers. I'll leave it to you to figure out the other four. Um, and this was a donation from one of our original board members, Larry Feldman, in memory of his recently deceased mother, Suzanne. So as we descend the rock and stream garden, I'm sitting here in front of a campanula. This is a campanula persiscifolia, take on white. Um, it's been leaning toward the sun a little bit, so if you look here closely, we've used some downed branches and stems just to hold the plant a bit upright. It's a technique called brushing up. It's um, often preferable to commercial metal stakes or even bamboo. It's a little bit more subtle use of staking in the garden. Here in front of the Campanula is a really neat heuchera called Lime Marmalade. I think it's aptly named. It will take some sun and it will take some shade with that big yellow chartreuse color to it. Um, kind of a fun plant to use as a ground cover. Next to that is a young example of an acanthus mollus or bears breeches. Um, you can see these very elaborate, very fun flowers right now in the late spring, early summer. Again, these are juvenile plants. Uh, the leaf whorls or this foliage will grow to be about two to three feet in height and width and will get multiple um, flower stalks as it gets a bit older. Then I'm next to this clethra or cinnamon bark. Um, you can see it's starting to have some exfoliating bark and I'll have that cinnamon color. And then here we're getting just the beginning of the flower scapes. These will get three to five inches long, um, be somewhat fragrant. Small tree, large shrub, good for a small scale garden. So continuing with some yellows as we've moved away from blue, I'm in front of a Thermopsis caroliniana. Some people call it Thermopsis velosa. I'll let you decide. It's a Carolina lupine. 
Um, this plant will get three to five feet with these really impressive yellow flower spikes and it'll leave us with an interesting hairy seed pod um, aggregation once we lose the flower. Next to that is another native. It's a diervella, sometimes called a bush honeysuckle. No relation to the honeysuckle whatsoever. We're growing two different cultivars here. One is Kodiak Black, which emerges with very dark purple foliage. And we're growing another one called Kodiak Orange, which gives us a really great orange fall color. Um, stepping back on the yellow theme, um, you'll see a fine textured Spirea Ogon, Spirea Thumbergia Ogon. It's a yellow Spirea, a small shrub. If it's really happy, it'll get to four feet by four feet. Um, but we have very few that have actually grown to that size. And then finally, along this back edge, another spirea um, is we have a small, and I won't say whimsical hedge, <laughs> of um, Nandina domestica, lemon lime. This is another new cultivar to me just within the past year or two. We've planted it once, it came through the winter, and it's forming sort of a small formal element in this otherwise very informal garden. So here we are in the full sun area of the garden and again all these plants were just planted this spring. We're already starting to see some nice height on this Helianthus, Helianthoides burning hearts. We are just about to get a yellow and red sunflower on top of it but we really planted it for this purple foliage which I think goes really well with this Achillea or the yarrow. This one's called Wonderful Wampy. Um, a very subtle pink blush color. Um, looks very nice against the foliage behind it and starts to blend in with some of the other plants we have in this particular area. Um, one of the most fun surprises, a plant I haven't grown ever, um, not, not, not this particular species of it, this is a Triflorum rubens, which you know as a clover. Don't confuse it with the Triflorum repans because that's the clover that's out in your lawn right now. Um, you wouldn't want to go to the nursery and ask for that. But this one, Triflorum rubens, probably one of the more ornamental um, purple clovers that you can find right now. Um, I believe this one comes from Europe. So running around my ankles here is another Campanula. This one is Carpetica. Um, we have a cultivar blue chips and white chips. I think you can see that for what they are. In front of me here, we have this Lychnus coronaria. It's really doing what it usually does. This is about all of its show, but we love this great color, the silver foliage and the height, as you can see it blowing around in the wind with these smaller alpines next to it. Um, all these plants will like this dry, well-drained area, including this small plant in front of me as well is a Lewisia cotyledon. Um, it's a hybrid and you can see the flowers that are just going past now. And once again, if we've gotten our drainage right, we'll see a nice spreading of these as a, as a sort of succulent alpine ground cover. Just above that, um, a plant that is just so much fun, no matter what species you grow. This is Lavendula angustifolia or a lavender. Um, we all are familiar with the perfume, but these flowers and that silver foliage uh, makes it a really strong border plant as well. And next to that is kind of an oddball, is we have a Thuya plicata whipcord. Um, this is an arborvitae. A lot of us think of it as a giant hedge. This plant won't get any higher than five feet. It will keep this weeping effect, and it has these very long leaves um, with its weeping habit and gives it that cult of our name of whipcord. Um, we're really eager to see what this does as it spills over into the stream. So here we are fully in the rock garden section, um, halfway down our stream toward the Temple of Love and a pocket where we've embraced the red. And when I say red, I mean red and orange and maybe a little pink and purple to give some nice contrast. Here in front of me, um, an obvious stunner, I think, is this Lychnus. It's dwarf orange. Um, sometimes known as silene, but I like it mainly just for this foliage. But when you get this red-orange pop of color on top of it, it really is sort of a showstopper. Um, stepping back just a little bit, we've used a combination of Potentilla and Geum in reds as well. 
again that same but different style plant with a similar flower and similar flower color. Um, here on my left we have a Nadia. This is a cultivar named Mars Midget, so you're seeing about the maximum height of its flowers and it's more toward a purple red to play around with these oranges. Um, another Lychnus species with the green foliage and it'll get about twice the height of the orange dwarf we've already looked at. Moving in through some more of the Nadia and some more of the Lychnus coronaria into some pink Salvia nemorosa, uh, and a plant that I've been really pleased with as it's been growing is this Scabiosa coronary uh, flutter deep pink. Um, there's a flutter deep blue that we've also used in this garden. But I really like what these pinks are doing against these reds and oranges we've been looking at. And then just over my shoulder here is another Lychnus um, cultivar called Vesuvius. Very much like the dwarf orange we just looked at, but it'll get another foot or two taller over time. So here we are in sort of a silly corner, intentionally silly. Um, I've always avoided using red, and we'll talk about red a little bit further. But here in front of me is this heuchera called Forever Red. So I obviously had to embrace it. And not an obvious combination, but one that's getting lots of smiles so far is it's paired with this ajuga, another foliage plant. It's ajuga repens, black scallop. And then here in front of me, speaking of kind of silly and small, is this salvia nemorosa marcus. It's not going to get much more than 8 or 12 inches, so it'll give us a bit more diameter, but you're not going to see much more height out of this particular plant. So thank you all for taking this virtual walk around the walk and stream garden with me today. And while I'm thanking people, I have to thank Senator Shelley Mayer for her help in procuring a grant that helped with the hardscape of this particular garden that Glen Carr Water Gardens was able to execute. I also want to thank Ira Feinberg of the Plant Group Nursery in Franklin, Connecticut. He had donated over 1,500 plants that were planted this spring and made this garden what it is. And also Ira Feinberg and his wife Candy donated this bench in memory of their son, Daniel. Um, and I have the privilege of sitting here in this garden on that space now.